reports and charts are my favorite part of the toolbox and I think they're really exciting and fun. So we're going to show you how to generate a whole bunch of different kinds of reports and start using the reports and charts option of the toolbox. You go to continuous or meteorological data fast track and it's the third button on the form. So it's this three reports and charts button and we click on that. And that opens up this form where you can see all of the different reports and charts that are available. So these purple buttons are all of the different reports and charts that the toolbox has. So the way this form works is that in this area that says input required, that's enclosed by the red border here, you have to fill this out first. And that tells the toolbox what data range you want for the reports and charts. So it works in order. So you have to go by order of site ID, sampler ID, pollutant, sampling year, and then the range. So we're going to start off with looking at our imaginary ozone data that we have imported into the toolbox. So we're going to select the site ID of our ozone. So the site ID of our ozone sampler is S46. And the sampler ID is INO3, and the pollutant is ozone, and the sampling year that I have imported is 2013. So there's two years here, and that's because we've archived data for PM 2.5 for 2015. So this sampling year box just looks at everything you've ever archived and says what years are there. So there's 2013 data and 2015 data in the archive table. So for ozone, I imported 2013, so I click on 2013. And when I do that, the range populates automatically. And it populates, again, based on the archive table. So the only data I've imported into the archive table for 2013 is between August 8th and August 22nd. So when you start importing a lot of data into the toolbox, this is always going to be based on everything you've ever imported. So if you only wanted to look at two weeks of the data, you'd have to adjust this range. And you can adjust it by clicking on the drop down. You also have the option of entering data directly into these drop boxes. Well, you can type in these boxes, even though the values aren't in the drop down list. Also is with QC data. You do a QC check before you start monitoring data. Maybe you did a QC check way back in high before you started monitoring just to see if your sample was going well and you know you can also look at your QC checks before you start monitoring data. So for me I'm gonna leave this as 88 to 822 because that's the range I want. And then you'll see this button here that says add temporary zero value pollutant records for data gaps in this range. What does that mean? So let's take a look at the help file and see if we can find information on what that means. Okay, so the help file, let's scroll down and see what we can find out here. So here is a little explanation of what this button does. And it says that it has the ability to gap fill for missing date, date and times in your pollutant concentration data. So in this particular range, the toolbox is going to look through that range and see if there's any data that wasn't logged by your sampler, and it can gap fill for those data. So it gap fills by adding a qualifier of GP to your data, and it adds a zero value record to your data. I'm going to show you in more detail what that is with the PM 2.5 data we look at. But let's go ahead and minimize this and try out this button and see what happens. So I click on this button, and it says for my ozone data, there's not any gaps. So I don't have to worry about doing any gap filling because there were not any gaps. So you don't have to do this step. The added benefit if there are gaps in your data because then your charts, they look different. So if, if there's gaps in your data and you don't gap fill, then it goes from, from like 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock and say that 10 and 11 wasn't in there, then it just goes automatically. But we're going to show you that in more detail. So I'm not going to go too much detail right now. We'll show you that with PM 2.5. So now we're ready to 
look at some chart. We're just going to go down this form and we're going to start with our quality control reports. And so we're just going to go to each one and see what they are. So report quality control checks. Let's look at it. To open up this report, you can either click on the radio button or you can click on this, this purple button. Let's go over some general information about these reports, the general setup of the reports. You'll notice this is pretty tiny. And if you want to make this larger, you can mouse over it and you get the magnifying glass with a plus sign in it. And if you click on that, it makes it bigger. Um, you'll also notice have some options. It opens up in print preview mode. And if you wanted to close the report, you can close it up here. And if you want to print it out, say you want to give it to your manager and say, hey, look at this, you can print it out from here as well. On the bottom right corner, you can see there's a page number. So it tells you this particular report has three pages. And if you wanted to get to the next page of the report, you use the navigation buttons that are on the very left hand side of the screen near the bottom. So this is how you get to the next page of a report. I should say that this is all I have access 2013. So all of this is how it looks in access 2013. If you have a different version of, of Microsoft access, it might look slightly different than my screen does. Just let us know if you have any questions about how the reports look in your screen and we can go from there. Then we'll go into some more details of each of these reports and what you can find in them. So this is a report of the QC data that we entered into the toolbox for our ozone sampler. And you can see that it goes through each of the checks you did and it tells you if it passed or failed. And it also tells you the, the requirements. So the shelter temperature must be between 20 and 30, and it is, and the toolbox says it passed. And here's that zero check that failed because it says the absolute value of the output is less than 0 0.003 parts per million. So this one failed. And these other checks passed, and it tells you why they passed in these little uh, parentheses here. Let's just go to the next page because remember we had, in this particular example, we had an ozone check that, I mean, a zero check that failed. And then we did some maintenance and we redid the check and then it passed. So if we click on the next page, we'll see. Okay, so this is when we did the next check and it passed. So if you look here on the first page, it tells you the QC date and time. So we did the first check August 8th at 8.02. Noticed it was failing. And then we repeated the check on August 8th at 8.50 after we did some maintenance on the sampler and it passed. So that's that report. And we can close this report and move on to the next one. If it's a report, it's preceded by report on the button. And if it's a chart, it's preceded by chart on the button. So you know what each of these are. So the next one is a chart. And that's a shelter temperature. So we're going to look at the chart for shelter temperature and see what that gives us. So on these charts, usually the way they work for the QC data is there's a limit. And if, a, if these points fall within limits, it means they were a passing check. So we have a high limit and a low limit for shelter temperature. And you'll notice all three of the checks I did fall within this range. So all of those are within the limits that are specified from EPA. So now we know that. I mean, we already saw that in the report, but it's always nice to see it again in the chart. So that's that one. And now we have zero checks. So let's look at our zero checks. So here was that zero check that failed. And you'll see it's way out of the range that it's supposed to be. And then we've got the second one. And then here, what happened? So we're missing a data point. I need to look at the report again because I'm not sure what happened here. Where is my point? So let's go back and look at the report. So I'm going to close this out and go back to the report and look at that last page. So that check on 822 looks suspicious. So let's see what was going on there. So the zero check in that particular date in time shows no indication of pass or fail, and there's no display or data log or output listed here. 
So I must have made a mistake when I did the data entry for this particular zero check. And what I think I did was I think I entered two as a zero input instead of in zero device display or zero data logger output. I'm going to need to check my logbook on that. So I look at my logbook and say, oh boy, yeah, that was the problem. That two was supposed to be entered into the zero device display field. I better fix that. So now I'll show you how to fix a QC entry that was made incorrectly. So I want to close out of the report and I can't fix anything in the report. The report, it just shows you the data. You can't fix anything from the report itself. So I need to go back in my QC form and fix this. So let's close out of this and we need to get back to our QC form. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make this smaller, this particular screen a little bit smaller so I can see the other forms in the toolbox. So I'm going to make this smaller and the way I do it, and I click on the lower restore button and make this smaller. So if you mouse over that, it says restore window. So I'm going to do that. And now I can see just sticking out a little bit here, I can see the, the continuous or meteorological data fast track form. So I need to click on that and that's going to bring it on top of this other form. So to access the QC form, I need to go back into data inflow. And I need to go back into enter quality control data. When you first open the QC form, it's always going to be a blank record because it assumes you're going to be entering a new QC check into the toolbox. So we need to find that QC check that we already entered. So to do that, we have these search options up here. So we can search for a particular check by entering the pollutant and the QC date of that check. And these are drop down boxes. So we can click in the drop down box and say, OK, this was an ozone check. And it occurred on 822. So here's the 822 check. And then we click on the search button. So then we can see our check. And now we can fix our error. So the error occurred on the zero check. And what I did was I entered two into the zero input known field when I should have entered it into zero device display. So I need to click on that zero input cell and I need to change this from a two to a zero because I know my zero input was supposed to be zero since it's a zero check. So my known is supposed to be zero and I had just incorrectly typed over it as a two. So I need to highlight that and type a zero on my keyboard. And then I can tab to the next field, which is zero device display. And I can enter a two as is recorded in my logbook. And then what you need to do, and this is important, is that once you enter it, make sure you tab out of that field because the toolbox, once you tab out, a check to see if that was passing or not. And if it turned out that was a failing QC check, then you might need to flag or possibly invalidate more of your pollutant concentration data. So let's tab out and make sure that nothing goes into the zero qualifier field. So nothing happened. So that means that QC check passed. That zero check was OK. So I don't need to take any further actions to flag or invalidate any further data. So I'm not, I've now fixed this problem so I can exit out of this form because all I wanted to do was fix that one little problem and exit out of this form. Now I can enter exit out of this form as well because I don't need to be in this continuous or meteorological data operations form so I can exit out of this and now I'm back in the continuous and meteorological data fast track and I click back on reports and charts and we're back in this form. So let's see if this was successful for sure. Let's check take a look at our chart again. And now we see we have three points. So that was a successful fix. It shows that it's within the, the range and it was a passing check. That's what I wanted to look at on that chart. Everything looks good now. And interesting, I had this one zero check that was way out of range. We know that, we know we fixed it. And so we can close out of this report and go to the next one. And, the, and you don't have to look at all of these reports every time you go to reports and charts. I'm just showing you all of them right now because I'm showing you what each of them are. 
just do the ones that are appropriate for you and the ones that you want to look at. You don't have to go through and do every single one every time you're in this reports and charts form. You can pick and choose. So the next one is the chart QC relative percent difference. So let's take a look at that chart. And what this does is it calculates the percent difference between the known and the measured value for each of the QC checks you did. So each of the known and measured, remember, I think I did four of them for my sample. So they're all on here. And this report shows them all, so it's kind of hard to see, but this is the relative percent difference. The highest relative percent difference happens to be the QC check one, according to the legend. So this one was a little high, but again, it wasn't above the, the maximum for this particular check, so it's still passing. It's just a little higher than the rest of them. So that's that chart. And then the next chart is the co-located samplers concentration chart. That's for if you have two samplers that are located at a site and you want to compare those two samplers. I don't have two samplers for my ozone data. I just have the one sampler. So I'm not going to click on that button since I only have one sampler. So I move on to select QC check number and these two reports under it. So what this does is it allows you to look at one of your known versus measured checks. So remember I showed you on that, that previous one where they were all like close together. Well, this one allows you to look at just one of them at a time. So remember I pointed out that the first one, the QC check one was the highest of them. So I want to look at that one. So I'm going to select QC check of one. So that was the first one. And then I'm going to look at just the relative percent difference for that one. That's, this is how that chart looks. And it's a little clearer since we don't have all of those points. And it just gives you a clearer picture if you just want to look at one of your QC checks at a time. And again, here's the limit of whether or not this check was passing. So since these relative percent differences were all lower than 7%, this is a passing QC check. Then we've got the known versus measured chart, and that's the same kind of idea, but it shows the known line and the measured line instead of the percent relative difference. So let's take a look at that. Here's the known. So we always had a known value of 55. And then here is the measured concentrations. So you'll see that there's a little bit of a trend going on here where the, the measured value is starting to go up a little bit. And that might be a concern as you collect data, and that might be something you want to watch. So after you've done a couple more QC checks, if this line continues to go up, so that's something you want to look into your sampler and see if everything's okay with it. You know, I don't know if this is going to continue or if it's going to start going down. So that's a, a, a to, to notice from this chart. The next couple of charts are the report QC completeness and the report QA completeness. This is a new addition to this version of the toolbox. So these charts are, are new to this version. And they show if your QC check and your QA check were performed at the required frequency. And in this context, what QC and QA means is that the QC checks are the routine checks that you do on your sampler. QA checks in this in this particular context means that that's was perfect was performed by an outside agency. So then and you enter that information into the toolbox. So let's take a look at QC completeness and see what that brings up. What this tells us is that for this ozone sampler, we're required, according to the EPA requirements, to do checks every two weeks. So it it tells us if those QC checks were completed at these re these frequencies. And that one thing to note here is that just because the check was completed, it doesn't mean it's passing. So the only check that the toolbox is making at this point is whether or not the check was completed. So let's, let's get a little bigger here. So we see that for this year, that the QC checks, the bi-weekly QC checks, so that those were the known versus measured values, were completed for this 
these two weeks periods. So in this span, the QC check was completed. So if we scroll down a little bit, let's see if I can do that. We'll see at the very bottom of the port report, it calculates a percent completeness. So it does it in two different ways. It does it based on the entire ozone season. So in this particular site, the ozone season is 26 biweekly periods. So ozone season for this particular site is the entire year. That varies depending on where you live. But in this particular imaginary site, it's uh, required to monitor ozone for the entire year. So based on the entire ozone season, which is this entire period, the completeness is only 8%. But based on sampling to date, it's 100% because let's say this is uh, in August and that's when I started and I still have some data to collect for this year, it's still going to start getting filled in. So it does a, a check based on the data that you've archived so far. And it's saying, based on the data you've archived, you've archived two weeks of data, you've got 100% completion on your QC checks. Um, okay, I'm going to close out of this report. And there was one more report, the QA completeness. But when I click on this particular report, I get a, a message box. And that's because I haven't entered any audits into my toolbox. So it tells me that you haven't entered anything. Just so you know, there's one annual performance evaluation required with a three, at least three audit levels checked. And it's required that you do that annually. Just so you know, I'm telling you right now, you might want to do that. So that just gets give you a warning if you haven't entered anything so far. Um, also, I want to mention that this is for ozone, but for PM 2.5, it does the same check, but it does it based on your flow rate verifications. Whereas for your gaseous pollutants, it does it based on the known versus measured. So that's all of the quality control reports and charts that you can you can play with at information from in the toolbox. Then we will move on and go into these next reports with and charts, which is based on your monitoring data. So the first one is the report hourly concentrations. So let's click on that and see what we get. So what this report does, let's make it a little bigger, is that it gives you the start time and the date, and then it shows you what the concentration is and then it shows you what flags you added to your data. So notice my first concentration is nulled. Why is that the case? That's because I invalidated that data. So we're not seeing the invalidation code here. We're seeing the flag. So we're seeing the toolbox flag. So this was my uh, level one zeros that was out of range and I had that failing QC check. So I invalidated that data. And when you invalidate the data, it shows up as a null in your reports and charts. So on the other hand, we also have these concentrations that are shown, and they have a flag as well. But we didn't invalidate those data. So that's why these are shown and this one's not. So this is an important example of what final data validation does. It nulls out the record where it's just flagging the data, keeps the record in your reports and charts, as well as the toolbox, I mean, the HUS ready files that the toolbox generates. So that's an important indication of the difference between flagging and invalidating. So if I scroll down on this report, this just keeps going on, and it says there's 13 pages in this report. Remember to go to the next page of report. You need to use these navigation buttons that are on the left-hand side of your screen. And if you want to go to the very last page of the report, you can use this one that looks like a little tiny arrow with a little tiny straight line at the end of it. And that's the last page. So let's just look at the last page of the report. So on the last page of the report, you get some summary statistics. So you get an average, a medium, a minimum, a maximum, a 99th percentile, as well as a completeness. And all of this is based on the range you selected. So this, this average, this medium, et cetera, is all based on the range that you selected. In this particular example, it's based on the two-week period. 
so completeness is also based on that. So why is this 92%? Why is this not 100%? The way completeness works is that once you invalidate a data point, that's no longer counted towards completeness. So we invalidated a couple data points, and that took away some of the completeness. Additionally, um, when completeness is calculated by the toolbox here, it's looking at the entire day. So notice we stopped our day of 8.22 at 7 a.m. So the toolbox is counting anything after 8.22 as, at 7 a.m. as missing hours. So that's why you're getting a lower completeness. When you import the next two-week sampler into your toolbox, it's going to see those data in there, and it's going to say, okay, never mind. That was just because that person didn't import data yet for there. So completeness means a little bit more the more data that you import into the toolbox. So that's why that completeness is not 100%. So that's that report close out of this and now we can look at a chart so let's take a look at how a chart looks of our hourly concentration data so this is how the chart looks at the very bottom of the chart it always tells us what the maximum pollutant concentration is for this selected range so for this selected range the maximum happens to be 85.4 parts per billion and it tells it tells us when it occurred an important thing to note about charts and the toolbox is that when you start getting a lot of data, it is really difficult to see anything meaningful. If you're looking at a huge range of data, like more than 30 days, that's probably about as, all, as much as the toolbox can show you with meaning. So if you wanted to, you could copy this data into a spreadsheet and do some more manipulations to the charts in in Microsoft Excel you of course you can always change the date range too you can, if you wanted to just look at a particular day you could change the date range as well but I'm going to show you how to do that just so you know that you can easily get the data into Excel and, and do further manipulations on the data if you are not comfortable with how the data is showing up in the charts in the toolbox so I'm going to close out of this for now, and I'm going to show you how to get the data into spreadsheet. So at the top here, we have this view data in spreadsheet format, and right now it's set to no. And by default, it's always set to no, because you want to look at the reports and charts and not the spreadsheet. But if you wanted to copy that data into a spreadsheet, you just need to change this to view data in spreadsheet format equals yes. And now, when we click on the chart button, we get something entirely different. So now, we get the data in spreadsheet format instead of chart format. So if I wanted to copy this data, you could click on this button right here that's to at the very top left corner. That's the square button that's right adjacent to the first column. And when you click on that button, it highlights everything. And then while you're still there, right click and do copy. And now we can open up Excel or any other spreadsheet format. And we can right click in that first cell and do paste. And that pastes the data from my toolbox into a spreadsheet where I can make further manipulations to the chart. I'm going to minimize that for now, and then I'm going to close this. And I always get this. It says you copied a large amount of data. I always just say, no, I don't want to keep it. It's just saying, do you want to keep it on your clipboard, which means do you want to keep a virtual memory of it? I just say no. So I, don't, I already pasted it, so I don't need to keep it. And that is how you export your data into spreadsheet format. So I'm going to change this back to no, so we can see the other reports and charts in regular format and not spreadsheet format. So now I'm going to look at uh, meteorological data. This is how my meteorological data looks in report format. And 
again, it's got 19 pages in this report. So if I want to go to the last page of the report, I click on this last page button. And then you'll see that on the bottom of this report, we've also gotten some statistics. Again, it, it runs a uh, percent data completeness and notice that 9% data completeness for relative humidity and precipitation is different than ambient temperature and wind speed. Ambient temperature wind speed is a little bit lower and that's because I had validated some records that had those really negative values and really, really high values. And that's why this percent data completeness is slightly different. Another thing to notice here is the average and total. So only for precipitation does it run a total. Everything else is averages for this particular period. But for precipitation, it's running a total. So the total amount of precipitation that occurred from 8 to 8 to 822. Now we can look at some charts. And these graph the concentration data versus the meteorological data. So these can be very useful in determining if your concentration data are valid. For example, say you have a high PM data and you want to look at wind speed around it and see if perhaps that could be caused by a wind storm. These are a very good way to look at that data side by side. So let's just look at the first one, concentration versus temperature. This is how this looks. We've got blue indicating the concentration values and yellow indicating the temperature values. And this is for outside temperature. If we had internal temperature, we'd have another line for internal temperature here. So that's just a comparison of meteorological data to concentration data in chart format. Go through all of these because they're basically the same thing. They're just looking at the concentration data versus your uh, meteorological data. So I'm not going to go through each of these, but I am going to point out one thing. So let's say I don't want the concentration data on my report. I just want to look at my, my meteorological data. I don't want to, I don't want this chart that shows both of them. How do I do that? So if you only want to look at meteorological data, the way you would do it is you would change your sampler ID to your MET sampler ID. So you would change this from your ozone sampler to your meteorological sampler. And then you would click on this pollutant box and notice there's nothing here. So for meter, if you only want to look at meteorological data, you leave your pollutant box empty. And you would select your sampling year again. And now let's look at this report, this chart with just meteorological data. So here's the same chart, but it just has the concentration data taken off and it only includes the temperature data. So that's how you do that, if you would ever want to do that. And we will move down. Actually, first we'll change this back to ozone, so we're looking at our ozone data again and not just meteorological data. So let's make sure we're looking at our ozone data. And we'll move on to the next little grouping here, and that's the average pollutant concentration reports. So these reports, they run averages over time. So let's say you wanted to look at the daily averages of ozone. So this report runs the daily averages. So in this particular example, I only have two weeks of ozone data imported. So I only have 15 values here. So each day it runs the average concentration for each day. And then at the bottom of the report, we've got some the uh, summary st statistics that are based on these daily averages. That's that. And we can do the same thing if we want to include our meteorological data as well. So this is the same report with meteorological data included. So it runs daily averages for ozone as well as your meteorologic parameters. Again, precipitation is based on a sum and not an average. So this sum says on August 11th, we got 1.57 inches of rain total, not average. And then on the last page of the report, again, here's the summary statistics for your ozone and your meteorological parameters. 
Now we will move on, and we're going to move on to the air quality index reports. These are new reports that have been added to this version of the toolbox. And what they do is they show you the air quality index for each day that you have archived data for. So let's look at the report daily air quality index, or AQI. So when I do this, I get this little message box that says, this report could take several minutes to display. Please be patient. Might want to take a coffee break. But in reality, when you're only looking at two weeks of data, this is going to be relatively fast. If you're looking at a year of data, give it a couple minutes to run. But we're only looking at two weeks worth of data. So we're going to just say OK. And this is probably going to just pop up really fast. A couple seconds. These are complicated reports. OK, so now it pops up. And what we're seeing here is that it shows us the AQI value that's calculated based on if you know anything about the AQI, there's a certain way to calculate these values. And then that's this calculation. And then it tells you the AQI description. And it's color coded based on the AQI. So it tells you when we're starting to get unhealthy, and when we're good, when we're moderate. And then if you scroll down, it also gives you totals. So you can see for this particular two weeks, most of the days were moderate. And you can close out of that. If we want to see the same data in chart format, we can do that. And it says again, it could take a while. Just click OK. And now we see the same data in chart format. So. These little numbers that are on the side of the chart indicate how many days fall in each of these categories. So again, you can see the majority of this pie chart is yellow, so most of the days were moderate. This particular chart is a little different, is that there's no print preview button because this is not showing in print preview. So, so the way you close out of this particular chart is by clicking on this lower X button. And then, then we've got a couple more reports. And these are, if you wanted to look at a different averaging period, that's not daily. So let's say I want to look at the average every week instead of just daily. So you would enter an averaging period here. So for a week's worth of data, I would enter seven days. So I want to see every seven days what the average is. You click on report, and then it shows you every seven days, it shows you the average, the minimum, the max the count and the standard deviation. And like I said, we only have two weeks of data imported so far into the toolbox. So for that last period, which starts on 822, we only have eight records so far. And as you as you add more data to the toolbox, that's going to change. And we can do the same thing for meteorological data. And this shows the same thing for meteorological data. Again, precipitation is summed, and everything else is averaged. 